Welcome to the Beyond X podcast. I'm your host, Mahir Abrahimi, and every week I speak to leading industry experts, trailblazers, and market leaders, where we discuss the key topics of our time in detail and have a deep dive conversation on areas like sustainability, technology, urban planning and city design, health and fitness, and more. In today's episode of Beyond Health, I spoke with Dr. Muzayan Jimzarli. In the first part of our discussion, we went over what hyperbaric oxygen therapy is, the different conditions it can treat, its effects on immune function and autoimmune diseases, benefits on cognition and cognitive function, some examples of typical protocols, and possible side effects. In the second part of our discussion, we expanded on Aviv Clinic's specific protocols and the various studies and protocols in the field of hyperbaric oxygen therapy around reverse aging, fat loss and body composition, athletic performance, and long COVID syndrome. And we also talked about how success is measured in an HPOT protocol, what the maintenance protocols look like, and what potential synergies lie with other forms of treatment. The different discussion points are all timestamped throughout the episode, so you can freely move around as you see fit. Dr. Mozayan has over a decade of experience as a medical doctor in general practice, medical gynecology, and pediatrics with roles in both the Middle East and France, and is currently a physician at Aviv Clinics Dubai, where she works as part of their state-of-the-art hyperbaric oxygen therapy and neurocognitive team. She holds a master's degree in epidemiology and clinical research from Claude Bernard University in France, a medical doctorate in family medicine from Jean Monnet University in France, and is certified in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In addition to her experience in family medicine, Dr. Mozaran also has an interest in gynecology, psychiatric and psychological disorders, and geriatrics. She is passionate about providing personal, comprehensive, and continued care for patients regardless of age, gender, or illness. So on that note, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Mozayan. Thank you so much for being here. I think it's going to be a great episode and I'm really looking forward to learning all the different things that HPOT entails. So thank you so much. for it. Thank you so much. Before I get into the technical aspect, I just want to ask you how you got into this. I know you were obviously a medical professional already, but what made you go into hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Yeah, sure. When I was introduced at first to hyperbaric oxygen therapy a couple of years ago, I was like, really? Like, what would we treat with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you know? Because I had very basic knowledge about it. We use it in diving medicine and for unhealing diabetic wounds, but I didn't have a lot of knowledge about it. And then I dived into all the research and I found out like a lot of research is going on in this field. And I found it very interesting, challenging, and I saw it a little bit like the future of medicine with these new technologies and everything. And I thought that I should absolutely be part of it. And this is how it started. And now it's been three years and I'm really enjoying. And we have so many medical indications that don't really have a medical treatment now and i've been seeing really amazing results on a lot of patients slash clients and i'm really happy to be here now and looking forward for the research and the science and whatever is going to come up in the upcoming years i can totally relate to that just when i was doing the research for this episode and looked at the videos and pictures of the dive which i'm sure you'll get into i just found it so interesting it looks very cool it looks very futuristic <laughs> kind of sci-fi. So very intrigued to learn more as we go. Could you set the stage here maybe and explain exactly what hyperbaric oxygen therapy is for our listeners, please? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a medical treatment that involves breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized chamber. Usually the pressure would be at least 1.5 atmospheres absolute, what we call ATA. And the treatment is designed to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the body's tissues and organ. So during the HBOT, I'm going to be using HBOT mostly. This is the abbreviation Good. of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The patient or slash client, I'll always say slash client because we're not always sick when we undergo hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So the client will be placed in a chamber that is pressurized while breathing pure oxygen. The increased pressure causes the body to absorb more oxygen than it would 
at normal atmospheric pressure. This will increase the oxygen amount in the body, which will help the body's natural healing processes and promote tissue repair. That's very concise. Thank you. You made it sound much simpler than I expected. So how does this compare to other types of oxygen therapy? And essentially, what are the other types of oxygen therapy out there? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy involves uh, breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized chamber. While other types of oxygen therapy involve breathing oxygen at a normal atmospheric pressure. I'm going to give some examples. So non-hyperbaric oxygen therapy would be, for example, breathing via an oxygen tank. And this is mostly used to treat conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what we call COPD or sleep apnea, which can cause actually breathing difficulties. We have another type like high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy called HFNC, which delivers a high flow rate of oxygen through a nasal cannula used in intensive care units to treat patients with respiratory failure or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Other types would be, for example, the nebulizer therapy. Each type of oxygen therapy has its own unique benefits and drawbacks. And the type of therapy recommended for a particular patient will depend on their individual medical condition and needs. In general, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is typically used for conditioning when there is a need to increase the amount of oxygen delivered to the body's tissues and organs beyond what is achievable with normal breathing or other oxygen therapy. Whereas the non-hyperbaric oxygen therapy are mostly used to treat respiratory conditions that require additional oxygen support. So they have completely two different indications. That makes sense. And there's different types of HBOT as well, if I'm not mistaken. I wouldn't call it different type. It's a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What will change would be the amount of pressure that we're going to be applying in the chamber and the length of each session and the total period of the treatment will be different from a protocol to a protocol and the types of chambers. We have the monoplace and the multiplace. This is the main difference, but they're all hyperbaric oxygen therapy, of course, and they are performed in medical clinics or hospitals according to the local regulations, because we have other oxygen chambers that we see at home or people are using in different types. And these, we don't really consider them as efficient hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And we even think that they could really be dangerous sometimes. So we need to watch out from these different kind of chambers that are really trendy and trending everywhere in the world now. Interesting. I do want to touch on that in more detail, but first you mentioned some of the different protocols and treatments that exist. What are, let's say, the most common conditions that you usually treat with HBOT? And what are some of the basic protocols if you would take us through the daily cycle and some of the parameters for each of these protocols? Yeah, of course. The protocols of HBOT can vary depending on the condition being treated, the severity of the condition, and whether it is an acute or chronic condition. In general, acute conditions may require shorter treatment courses at a higher pressures, while the chronic conditions may require longer treatment courses at lower pressures. Some of the conditions that may be treated with HVOT include carbon monoxide poisoning and decompression sickness disease that we find mostly in divers who have ascended too quickly from deep yeah. dives. And some of the chronic conditions that could be treated with HVOT include traumatic brain injury, diabetic wounds, radiation injuries, and cerebral palsy in children. So what would the protocol be for some of these examples? For example, if someone has a TBI, what would a normal procedure be? I know it would vary based on the specific requirements of the individual client slash patient, but what would a generic treatment flag for some of these conditions? So a traumatic brain injury, for example, can be really different. It could be really serious or it could be really mild. And both of them has completely different symptoms. 
Let's give an example for a mild traumatic brain injury, an example of someone, I don't know, 25 years old, was on an electrical scooter, fell, had an accident, didn't lose consciousness, everything was normal, went to the emergency room, MRI is normal, everything is normal. But then this person noticed in the everyday life that he has some cognition, let's call it decline. As memory is not like before, forgetting keys, names, having to write down everything, for example, to remember the tasks or the meetings of the day after, feeling a little bit anxious, more than usual, sleep disorder. And these problems can even get worse and worse with time. And they cannot actually understand these individuals what's going on. This is what we call the post-concussion syndrome that's already there. MRI is normal. Neurological exam is normal. So there's no clear diagnosis for this. And this is what we call mind traumatic brain injury. And when these clients or patients come to us and we assess all this, we have uh, a specific protocol for them. So what they do is 60 sessions of HBOT, five days a week. So it's a treatment for three months, five days a week. Every day they come for a couple of hours of uh, oxygen therapy. What is specific for the Aviva protocol, we have a comprehensive holistic protocol around this with specific follow-ups and trainings, especially neurocognitive training for these patients. And we have research and a great paper about it. And we have amazing results, cognitively, emotionally, the load, Everything gets significantly better after they complete the three months of HBOT treatment. We can definitely go into more detail, I think, with more of the specific protocols, but I want to cover a few more of the conditions that can be treated first. I'm specifically curious about immune function. How can HBOT help the immune system fight off infections or viruses, for example? And on the other end of the spectrum, I'm very curious if there are any potential benefits or protocols for autoimmune diseases like MS or rheumatoid arthritis, if there are any specific protocols for these. We need to differentiate immune system and autoimmune disorders because they are right. two different things. So to answer the first one regarding the immune system, during hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the increased oxygen delivery can help fight infections and promote tissue repair by stimulating the body's immune system through the release of growth factors and cytokines. So growth factors are proteins that regulate the cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. Cytokines are signaling molecules that regulate the immune response by activating and directing the immune cells to the site of infection or injury. HPOT can also increase the production of what we call reactive oxygen species, ROS, which are molecules that play a role in the body's immune response. ROS are produced by white blood cells, which are responsible of our immune system and help to kill bacteria and other pathogens by damaging their DNA and other cellular components. So with these three different pathways, HBOT enhances our immune system. So we are able to better fight, if I can say, against infections and inflammation. However, in autoimmune disorders, some studies have investigated the use of HBOT in patients with autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and Crohn's disease. While the results of these studies are mixed, some have suggested that HBOT may be beneficial for reducing symptoms such as pain and fatigue and improving overall function in these patients. But it is important to know that HBOT is not a cure for autoimmune disorders, and that should only be used as a complementary therapy in conjunction with other treatments, such as medication, physical therapy, and lifestyle modifications, depending on what is indicated in each medical condition. Amazing. So 
definitely noticeable significant improvement in finding infections and improving immune response. But on autoimmune, it's very different and can only really just help with reducing symptoms or severity of episodes. Exactly, because the pathway is completely different. The physiopathology of the autoimmune system disorders is completely different from what HBOT impact is in the system. So HBOT would reduce the inflammation. These patients, when they come to us, actually their flare-up, the pain, the flare-up will reduce during the treatment because of the HBOT. But at the end of the treatment, the disease is still there. The medical condition is still there. And they still have to take their medication or continue the medical prescription that they already have initially with their doctor. Of course, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. So I want to expand on the protocols some more, but first to step back a little bit, when we're talking about oxygen therapy, the mind immediately goes to breathing. And one of the things that I think is gaining popularity in certain circles is breath work. What are your thoughts about this overall? Could there be synergies between HBOT and breath work in general? Actually, it's a very interesting question, and I get it very often from our clients and patients. The similarities between oxygen therapy and breath work may be due to their shared goal of increasing oxygen delivery to the body's tissues and organs. Both therapies aim to improve oxygenation, which can have a wide range of benefits for overall health and wellness. However, expert techniques such as, I'm going to give two examples. I'm not a specialist in breathwork techniques, but I have a general idea about it. So pranayama and holotropic, for example, breathing involve conscious manipulation of the breath, uh, which can increase oxygen delivery to the body and enhance relaxation and mental focus. These techniques have been used for centuries in various cultures and traditions as a way to promote physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a more targeted form of oxygen therapy, which is an evidence-based treatment that has been shown to have a wide range of medical applications that go way beyond the physical and emotional well-being. So they are completely two different therapies, but they have the same goal. Almost the same goal. While there is currently limited research on the potential synergies between oxygen therapy and breath work, it is possible that these therapies could be used together to enhance their overall benefits. For example, patients undergoing HBOT may benefit from practicing breath work techniques to enhance relaxation and reduce anxiety during treatment. And we do encourage a lot these, these techniques during the treatment of hyperbaric oxygen therapy if our clients are really into the breath work and even meditation. So these, these things really encourage them to continue doing because we know that it can lead to relaxation and mm -hmm. reduce a lot the anxiety in patients. Clients. And what about the less traditional types of breath work, the ones that are not so spiritual, let's say in nature, like cyclic sighing and cyclic hyperventilation and other breathing techniques? And maybe just to define it quickly for the listeners, these are breathing techniques where you manage the rate and speed of your inhales and exhales for a period of time for different effects, essentially trying to increase the amount of oxygen that you intake or increase the amount of carbon dioxide that you exhale over that period of time. There's some recent studies done that have looked into the short-term benefits of these breathing exercises, and some of the improvements included things like improved respiratory function, cognitive function, immune response, anti-inflammatory effects, mood, and some other things, I think. And to me, this seemed very similar to just everything you described about HPOT's benefits. I'm sure there's no studies comparing or looking at these similarities, but what are your thoughts on this maybe overall? Regarding the studies, usually in medical research, the studies that we use actually to prove a certain effect, we have to take a certain number of people and with hyperventilation, without hyperventilation, and actually be able to compare them before and after, for example, a course of therapy and say, for example, 50 sessions of hyperventilation will get you from point A to point B significantly. As long as we don't have this data, it's very difficult for us as doctors to 
say that it's medically or evidence-based. Then we have another type of research, of course, that can be based mostly on the physiopathology and what's actually happening in the body physiologically when we're doing this hyperventilation. It activates certain pathways, and this is why mm -hmm. logically we get these results. I totally agree, and I know that it has a lot of benefits as well. But with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it's completely different because we're giving more oxygen, actually. And with the pressure, oxygenation of the tissues is done via the diffusion of oxygen because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So the amount of oxygen that we are actually delivering to the tissues is way beyond what we can deliver by hyperventilation or other breath right. works. This is why the results are completely different and they are more, the HPOT is more indicated and complicated and serious medical conditions. And we have amazing, amazing results. I completely understand. And you know, that's an important distinction to make between medical and other types of studies. So as a side note, there are scientific papers that do study the subject of cyclic hyperventilation. A recent one out of the Stanford Huberman lab comes to my mind where they studied, I think, over 100 subjects during the time of COVID. I'm not sure exactly what the parameters were, but they did find statistically significant benefits in the patients or subjects. But again, that is not a medical study as far as I'm aware, at least. So I think you clarified it perfectly, especially with the distinction here on the amount of oxygen and the pressure that is applied, obviously, that the pressure within the suite that can't be created in a normal setting with just breathing. So based on this, you did touch a bit on the pressure range earlier as well. Is there an optimal range of pressure and duration for hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Can you break this down for us to specific ranges and time frames for the different protocols? Usually the pressure that we use is going to vary, as I mentioned earlier, according to the indication, if it's acute, if it's chronic and the duration of the treatment. The pressure that are used usually are between 1.5 and 3. ATA, was for absolute, and the usually used pressure would be mostly two ATA. And this is what we are using in the Aviv clinics because we treat mostly chronic conditions. And when we use a lower pressure, the treatment can last for a longer time. So we give high amount, high numbers of session. It can go up to 60 sessions and the sessions usually can go from 30 to 90 minutes in total. And this depends as well on the pressure, on the indication and on the length of the treatment. So there are so many different protocols. Okay. The most important thing is to remember that the usual used pressure is 2ATA. We can use 1.5. We use it mostly in children. We can go up to three if it's really acute medical condition and we're doing only a few sessions, not very high number of sessions. And uh, this protocol will vary, as I said, according to the indication, chronic, acute, serious, less serious, and according to the research as well, because we have a lot of research for the different indications. And from there, we know what is the optimal number of pressure, number of sessions, and what is the optimal pressure to be applied in a certain uh, medical condition to have the best of results limiting as well the side effects. So we want to right. balance, like we want the best of results and the less side effects. I do want to expand on the side effects, but first, how about the oxygen? Is there any variance on how this is delivered? Is it always pure oxygen? And does that vary throughout the different types of procedures and protocols? So usually when you're in the chamber, the multi-place chamber, the oxygen is delivered in a mask or as wood. And usually it's 100% oxygen, medical oxygen. Whereas when you are in the mono chamber, so you're lying down in the mono chamber, it's only one person inside. The whole chamber is filled with 100% oxygen. And by saying that, it's important to emphasize on something it's the multi-place chamber, because the oxygen is delivered in a mask or in a hood, the risk of fire is less. While in the mono chamber, because you have the whole space is filled with oxygen, the risk of fire would be higher. And I presume they would remove any metals and other flammable objects, right? 
of course, we have safety is very important. This is the number one thing that we do. And even that <laughs> is protocol, we check the clients slash patients on daily basis and several times before they go at the suite. And right. even the uniforms are all the same, 100% cotton, no pockets. Understood. You mentioned side effects. So what are some of the side effects of HBOT? And more importantly, I'm curious, can HBOT ever be harmful to someone who is otherwise perfectly healthy? I need to mention here that HBOT is a very safe treatment in general. Of course, if it's, as I said, really performed in a medical facility that is certified according to the local regulations and under the supervision of experts, like very experienced medical staff. I would mention mostly the side effects related to the high pressure, what we call biotrauma, and the side effects related to the high exposure to oxygen, so the oxygen toxicity. Related to the high pressure, we commonly see mostly the biotrauma related to the middle ear. It's like going on the plane, you know, and you have a problems equalizing and you feel like you can't really pop up your ears and it could lead to pain or it can get even worse sometimes, but we make sure that we don't get there. So when we cannot equalize in the suite, we stop the pressurizing right away. It could be related to the sinuses as well, you know, and the lungs because they're all air filled spaces in our body. Vision can change as well, especially um, cataract. Cataracts sometimes can get a little bit worse. So this is why we always do a vision checkup before we go in the high pressurized chamber. Regarding the oxygen toxicity, I would mention mostly the brain and the lungs that could be affected by this. This is extremely rare actually to have, and we really might see these side effects if we expose the individual to a very high pressure with high oxygen for a long time. Other side effects are there. They're less serious. For example, the repressed memories can come back. So memories wow. from the past. That's a risk with any type of therapy, right? <laughs> yeah. And this is mostly, actually, but this is mostly interesting in treating other indications like the fibromyalgia and PTSD, especially when they're related okay. to trauma in the past. So all these memories can come back. So this is why it's That's important right. to have experts and very experienced staff around the patients to take care of these specific conditions as well. So you have mental health professionals on staff as well, I presume? Of course. Yeah. I'll definitely touch on the brain more because that's very fascinating, but you mentioned vision. So I'm just very curious, can HBOT improve vision in anyone? Unless you have cataracts, of course. It can improve vision. So we have a lot of clients like, I don't need my glasses anymore. I need to change them. And then we tell them, no, don't, because this is not going to last forever. So it might uh, improve the vision during the treatment, but once you complete mm -hmm. the treatment, actually, it will go back to how it was before. Yeah. Damn, you had my own up just a little bit. <laughs> That's fair enough, though. You talked about the quality and the importance of using medically managed HBOT. Can you expand on that? Are there any specifications that need to be abided by? Any potential malfunctions or anything else along those lines that could happen? Going into the equipment, it's very technical here, but of course, equipments have to comply with a lot of regulations and mostly safety regulations. You know what? I would love to share a picture at least. I don't know, maybe we can add it later and it will explain yeah, better than me talking it. how it looks sure. like. Because it's like a spaceship actually. And it's, it's like incredible. Okay. And <laughs> even we have experts, HBOT experts, the operators who operate the suite as well. And of course, it has to comply with a lot of regulations, safety regulations, technical re engineering, everything. It's very sophisticated equipment. And most of it is manufactured abroad. And there are specific, can I say, brands and branding yeah. or our companies actually specialized in manufacturing these chambers, especially the multi-place ones. And I can say that here in Aviv at Dubai, we have the biggest ones, the biggest ones, and it's the biggest facility so far, especially in the GCC. Mm -hmm. The mono chamber, it's less complicated, but still it needs very high qualifications and regulations to actually be able to have the medical 
one, because as I said, a lot of people have the mono chamber at home and it's not the a specific equipment needed actually to get the efficiency from the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the right efficiency. And uh, it is very crucial for it to be, as I said, medically certified because it could be inefficient and really dangerous. And we have seen dramatic incidents in the past related to the misuse of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. If you look at it, there are really dramatic results. And this is one of the reasons why people sometimes they're a little bit afraid or they don't really believe in it because of what happened in the past. And this was just related to the misuse of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, because when it's really used in the right way, it's a safe treatment if right. it's done in the right way. Okay. So make sure you use medical professionals and their assistance. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the equipment, you mentioned the various brands and companies that produce them. So if, for example, someone is exploring undertaking HPO2 treatments at two or three different clinics that provide it, and I know you work for Aviv clinic, so you might be a bit biased here, but if they're contemplating doing HPOT, what should they be looking at? Are there differences between the equipments different clinics have, or are the professionals and the protocols that are used the main differentiator? And then maybe if you can expand a bit on the key parameters of these protocols. So usually the chambers that are implemented or will be implemented in clinics or in hospital facilities that are certified in Dubai will be certified because if not, the health authorities will not allow this treatment to happen in any of the clinical or hospitals here. So they are certified. Certified, it means that, yeah, it works, it's medical, it's a good equipment. The difference would be mostly in the protocols and the experience of the staff as well. So the Aviva protocol is unique protocol, different based on research that mostly Professor Shai have been leading for more than 15 years. And this protocol, the core of it is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but it has a lot of other trainings with experts that will be going on the same time as you're having your hyperbaric oxygen therapy to enhance and increase the benefits and the results at the end of the day. And after three months, what we're, we're aiming to do as well, you know, in any treatment, if you just get the treatment and stop there and continue with your lifestyle, that's not really healthy. It will not last forever, right? So during right. these three months of treatment, we do our best to actually change the lifestyle of these clients and patients. And not in a sudden way, because everything that we start suddenly like this and we ask them to stop everything, it will not be sustainable. So we have enough time during these three months actually to educate, to help, to support our clients during the treatment, to change their lifestyle slowly to a better lifestyle. So they get the best of benefits at the end and they can continue actually a healthy lifestyle later on and prevent any decline in their health, physical or mental or cognitive. So this is the main difference. And another difference is more technical in the suite. We don't give our clients oxygen continuously during the two hours. Actually, they put the mask on for 20 minutes and then they remove the mask for five minutes. And we do the cycle three times. And this is what we call the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. And there's a very interesting paper about this if you're interested in research. And during these five minutes, actually, of hypoxia, lack of oxygen that we are mimicking in the body from 100% oxygen to 21%, actually, during these five minutes, we trigger the increase of the growth factor in the body and we activate different pathways, which will lead to increasing the amount of stem cells, Interesting. which are the main components of regenerating the regenerative process in the body and mostly in the brain to get significant results cognitively and physically at the end of the treatment. That's very interesting. I wasn't expecting that at all. You mentioned HPOT can improve cognitive performance in individuals suffering from neurological disorders. And I think there's quite a bit of research studying the impacts of HPOT on TBIs. What is the underlying mechanism for this? Essentially, how does HBOT positively impact the brain? Is it through the production of additional stem cells? And could you go into how this manifests? Or are there other factors, maybe especially with the mitochondria, on improving brain function? So 
In traumatic brain injuries, the brain experiences physical damage that can cause a range of cognitive, physical, and emotional symptoms, depending on the severity and the location of the injury. HPOT can improve cognitive performance in individuals suffering from neurological disorders. It could be a TBI or any other injury like stroke, for example, by increasing the blood flow to the brain tissue. And how does this blood flow increase? I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. We have an increase in stem cells. So these stem cells are basic cells. They don't have identity yet. Then they grow and they differentiate into specific cells, like in different organs, like brain, um, neurons, uh, vessels, uh, muscles. So in this case, we increase the blood flow in the brain because we have more blood vessels, what we call angiogenesis, because of the stem cells differentiating into blood vessels. And therefore, we enhance the oxygenation of the damaged tissue. So when we enhance it, then it will help better repair the tissue. On the other hand, hyperbaric oxygen therapy promotes what we call neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain actually to form and reorganize synaptic connections in response to changes in the environment or to the injury. By promoting neuroplasticity, HPOT can help improve the brain's ability to recover and adapt in response to injury, leading to improvements in cognitive function and quality of life. So we have these two processes. They're very important, the neuroplasticity and the angiogenesis in the brain. And with these two combined, as a result from the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, individuals improve their cognitive functions and physical performance as well, if they have any deficits. That's very interesting. So... In that case, I'm presuming then that you can also use this to improve age-related uh, decline, right? Things like dementia, Alzheimer's. Are there specific protocols to help prevent or at least reduce the impact of these things? And maybe to expand on that, when we're talking about HPOT's impact on cognitive function, if you look at, let's say, otherwise healthy adults, how can HPOT cause both short-term and long-term improvement? Studies published in recent years indicated that hyperbaric oxygen therapy can help slow down and even improve cognitive decline, particularly in the early stages. However, prevention of cognitive decline is seen as the key, and there is a strong emphasis on spreading awareness about the importance of staying mentally and physically active throughout all stages of life. As a part of the Aviv Medical Protocol, specifically because we've done research on this using the Aviv protocol and on aging and reverse aging and preventing dementia and Alzheimer's. HBOT is combined with regular physical exercise, a healthy diet, cognitive training, and social interaction to optimize the results. This comprehensive approach to brain health has yielded extraordinary Mm -hmm. outcomes, especially in early dementia, very early stages or in mild cognitive impairment as well. Even if you don't have an injury like a traumatic brain injury or stroke or any physical damage in the brain, even in healthy individuals, HBOT will enhance neuroplasticity and angiogenesis and can improve the cognitive function. When I say cognitive function, it's mostly the memory, attention, focus, information processing speed, executive function, motor skills, And we can actually show the patients slash clients objectively the improvement that they had because we do a very holistic and comprehensive evaluation before the treatment and after the treatment. So they do feel it when they finish the treatment, of course, when they complete the number of courses assigned at first. But they do see it objectively as well. They can see their improvement in the different fields. And for this, we really use scientific proof tests. Every test that we're going to be using in the physical uh, therapy, physiology assessment, or in the neurocognitive assessment is the approved scientific uh, tests that are used worldwide and are according to the health recommendations. I want to know more about the testing and the Aviv protocols, but let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> 